Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you like, you can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash Canada EHX. First, on every single tier, you get completely ad-free episodes. And you get a say in what topics I cover on my podcasts. You can also donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking donate. Or you can go to buy me a cup of coffee slash Craig U. All of these links are also in my show notes. And for people who donate, I have various levels of benefits. For $5, you get a thank you at the start of the next episode of Canadian History X, Canada's Great War, and from John to Justin, and on social media. For $10, you get everything from the $5, plus this episode is sponsored by, with your name at the start. Also, I'll state it's sponsored by you on social media. For $20, everything from the $5 and $10, plus a second episode sponsored by you, and promotion of something you're working on. And for $50, everything from the $5, $10, and $20 plus, you get to choose a topic for me to cover on Canadian History X. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D. And I'm on Instagram and TikTok where I put up daily videos about Canada's history. Just go to my username, Bairdo37. And you can find weekly videos on Canada's history on my YouTube channel. Just go to youtube.com slash c slash Canadian History X. If you want to find transcripts of every episode I've ever done, you can go to my website, CanadaEHX.com. And there's over 700 posts on Canada's history there. And on that note, I have to say welcome to my newest patron, Tom McMillan. Thanks, Tom. I truly appreciate you joining on as a patron. And before we continue, I want to mention that I have a new podcast out there called Canada, A Yearly Journey. In it, I'm looking at every single year in Canada's history from 1867 all the way up to today. This week, I released 1868, and I really like this podcast. I think you'll really enjoy it as well. So if you want, you can subscribe. It's on all podcast platforms. And again, that's Canada, A Yearly Journey. Before I start, I looked all over the place to get the proper pronunciation of this individual's name, and I was not able to find it. So I'm going to be doing my best. I took three years of Mandarin in high school, so I believe it's pronounced Wong Fun Qian. Now, I could be wrong, but I'm going to refer to him as Wong Fun Qian, and then throughout the episode, I'm going to refer to him as Wong, just to make things easier. So... If I did mispronounce it, I I really do apologize. Called the mayor of Chinatown by the people of Vancouver, Wang Funxian spent his life advocating for Chinese Canadians and worked to end discrimination against his community. Today, I am looking at his life and impact on Canada. Born Wang Mengpu on July 7, 1899 in China, he would come to Cumberland, British Columbia in 1908 with his parents. His parents would become successful merchants, and he would say of his early life, quote, When I was just a small little boy, my family ran a store in Cumberland, and at Chinese New Year we closed the store for two weeks, and we decorated it with candles and scrolls and banners, and we served our friends drinks and sweetmeats inside. I was just a small little boy, and I served the drinks and the sweetmeats, and they gave me money, and I remember I made over $100 in one day. Oh yes, those were the good days. End quote. It was his parents' hope that Wong would return to China to build a career. There were plans for Wong to return to China to get an education, but these plans were derailed when Sun Yat-sen came to Cumberland. Sun was a revolutionary who came to the area on a fundraising trip, and this would have a lasting impression on Wong, who would decide to study law. Once he had completed high school, he became one of only five Chinese students to enroll at the University of British Columbia. During this time, he would also become the president of the Chinese Students' Alliance of Canada and the Chinese Canadian Club. Throughout his life, Wong never wanted to return to China. The Vancouver province would write, quote, Canada was the adopted land of Funxian, and he loved it so much he never did return to the country of his birth, not even Hong Kong and always said he had no desire to do so, because in Canada, he had found his own country and his own home. End quote. 
After Wong graduated, he would become a court interpreter hired by the Attorney General of British Columbia. He was unable to practice law despite graduating because of his inability to be on the electoral list as a Chinese Canadian, which prevented him from practicing the profession. In 1924, Janet Smith was murdered in Vancouver with the suspect being Fun Sing Wong. A private detective, two detectives, and two British Columbia Provincial Police officers would kidnap Fun Sing Wong and hold him for months. He would be beaten and questioned over the murder, with Wong providing the translation. The Vancouver Press would state that Wong was an employee of the detective agency and he performed services for police off the record. The kidnapping would spark outrage in Vancouver and a group of Chinese merchants filed a complaint against Wong's actions to the Attorney General. Wong's role would be seen as a conflict of interest as he was working for the court and assisting the investigation. In the end, Fun Tsing Wong would be acquitted due to lack of evidence and would return to China. After the uproar died down, Wong would go on to establish the Kuang Li Thai Company. The company was a Chinese legal broker that employed interpreters to handle cases involving Chinese Canadians in the city. In 1927, Wong was charged with assault and robbery after another man had been found dazed after he was struck with a monkey wrench to the head. The man said that Wong and another man had assaulted him, but this would later prove to be untrue and charges were dropped. In 1937, Wong was named the publicity agent of the Chinese Benevolent Association, which had been established in 1906. His role was to bring publicity to the Aid to China program during the war between Japan and China. He would also put out ads to the Vancouver Sun asking that the citizens of Vancouver buy Christmas gifts that were made in China in order to help the country's economy as it fought against the Japanese. In 1942, Wong created the Chinese Trade Workers Association. Two years later, in 1944, Wong created a petition that contained seven points requesting that Chinese Canadians be given the right to vote in British Columbia elections. This petition would be sent to both the provincial and federal governments. Wong would say, quote, Our hopes have never been so high. We don't expect to use the privilege until 1949. End quote. He would be pretty accurate in that statement. It would not be until 1947 that Chinese Canadians could vote in federal elections and in 1949 in British Columbia. After Chinese Canadians gained the right to vote in federal elections in 1947 and the Chinese Immigration Act was repealed that same year, Wong became an advocate for removing the remaining restrictions on Chinese immigration into Canada. He also sought to stop the separation of families due to the restrictions and to seek a redress for the Chinese head tax. In 1948, Wong became the co-chairman of the Chinese Benevolent Association and he would remain in that position for the next 11 years. It was under his leadership that the organization would reach its peak. Every year from 1949 to 1959, Wong traveled to Ottawa to lobby politicians over immigration and the head tax. This gained him considerable press throughout the country. He would often appear in the media to talk about the lobbying, and Chinese-Canadian media covered his trips extensively. As a result of this, he became a highly influential spokesperson for the Chinese community in Canada. In 1956, Immigration Minister Jack Pickersgill would state that he would give consideration to allowing the spouses of Chinese Canadians to come to Canada. Pickersgill had been presented with a brief from Wong, who would say that he was very happy with the talks and was hopeful there would be a relaxation of the immigration legislation. Later that year, immigration rules would be relaxed to allow aged parents of Chinese Canadians to come to the country. Wong would say of it, quote, a step in the right direction, end quote. The process would continue, though, past the time of Pickersgill and into the time of Ellen Fairclow. Wong would tell her, quote, We are frankly the victims of discrimination. Since 1950, less than 20,000 Chinese have been admitted to Canada. In that same period, approximately 1.8 million immigrants from other countries have found peace and refuge and inspiration in this country, end quote. He would add that in 1931, Canada had a population of 10 million with 46,000 Chinese Canadians. Two decades later, in 1951, Canada had a population of 15 million, but only 32,000 Chinese Canadians. He would say, quote, No similar barriers are erected against any other nationality. End quote. Thanks to his efforts in lobbying, Canadian immigration laws would be liberalized, and hundreds of Chinese families were able to reunite since Chinese Canadians could now sponsor their spouses 
unmarried offspring, and parents. Throughout his life, Wong supported the Liberal Party, but he would support the progressive conservative, Douglas Young, in the 1957 and 1958 elections. Young would become the first Chinese-Canadian Member of Parliament. In 1958, Wong would save his own re-election to the association presidency, quote, I am pleased, but I will want to step down as soon as there is someone new who wants to do the job, end quote. He would actually step down the following year, stating, quote, I feel that a man can only be useful in the one position for so long, end quote. In 1959, the RCMP and the Canadian Immigration Department began an investigation into an alleged racketeering operation by Chinese Canadians to illegally bring Chinese immigrants to Canada. In the operation, the RCMP raided residences, businesses, and organizations of Chinese Canadian community leaders. They would seize over 30,000 passports, visas, and other documents. Wong would consider these raids to be systemic human rights violations, and he would state, quote, the situation resembles a country under martial law. If the government does not restrict such actions, the basic rights and freedoms of people are endangered. End quote. In July 1961, Wong's files were taken in an RCMP raid of his home, the hotel room of his secretary Wong Gam Chan, and the offices of the Chinese Benevolent Association. Wong would say that the files taken include the names and some details about nearly every Chinese person in Canada. Wong and several Chinese community associations would conduct media campaigns denouncing the actions, and in the end, very few people were convicted under the RCMP operation. By the 1960s, Wong began to spend his time advocating against Chinatown developments that he worried would separate the community from the rest of Vancouver. In 1963, he resigned from the consultative committee that was created by Mayor William Rathy due to his opposition to the Strathcona Rehabilitation Project development. He would call the development the equivalent of the Berlin Wall, as it separated the business and residential areas of Chinatown. The development would raise 30 acres of high-rise building on land that was taken from Chinese property owners. The Vancouver province would write, quote, Chinatown spokesman Fun Qian said it is feared a vote for the community centre would in effect show approval of the clearance plan and its program of building destruction, end quote. Mayor Rathi stated that the Chinese Benevolent Association could submit its own plans for the development. The organization did, which were favorably received by the community. In the end, though, the Vancouver City Council approved the developer's plan the next week. In 1967, Wong was named the Vancouver Brotherhood Citizen of the Year for his efforts to fight discrimination in the city. And on July 31, 1971, Wong passed away. One person who was not identified in the article about Wong's death stated, quote, his whole life he gave everything to it and asked little in return. He worked always for the Chinese people and for Canada. End quote. Throughout his life, Wong had detractors who accused him of only trying to raise his own profile, but the results of his life speak for themselves. Roy Meg, publisher of the Chinatown News in 1971, stated, quote, No doubt some of the strong feelings towards him were the result of personal envy and rivalry. He was all too aware of these, but took them in his stride. If controversy was the price of leadership, then he had his share of disagreements with many. With all, he left behind more friends than enemies. End quote. Wang's funeral was one of the most attended in the history of Chinatown. In 2008, he was named a person of national historic significance. In 2011, he was named one of the top ten Vancouverites in the city's history. The entry states, quote, Wang Funxian, a journalist, labor activist, and community leader, advocated for the repeal of the Chinese Immigration Act, a notorious piece of legislation that prevented Chinese immigration to Canada. He campaigned tirelessly for the Chinese-Canadian rights, including citizenship, and a more liberal approach to immigration and family reunification. End quote. I hope you enjoyed that episode of my look at Wong Fun Xian. If you did, please leave a rating and review. Next week, we're looking at the St. Lawrence Seaway. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D, and I'm on Instagram at Bairdo37. As well, again, if you want to support the podcast, you can for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash canadaehx. And you can donate to the podcast by going to canadaehx.com and clicking donate. And I also want to thank all of my wonderful patrons. 
and I apologize if I get any names incorrect. Tom McMillan, Mike Sullivan, Wendy Mills, Keelan Prignitz, Michael Matthews, Joanna Parker, Jeff Dahl, Vobs, Robert Page, Richard T., Colin Johnson, Jeff Hershey, Kyle Murray, Steve Pakin, Matthew Gartho, Lionel Romaine, Dr. Bob Turner, Randy Hayden, Doug Campbell, Reg W., Deborah Carlson, Francis Helbling, Nixon Ree, Shannon Marshall, Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Chauve, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Roy, Luke S., J.P. Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, and Iris Gray. Information from Library and Archives Canada, Parks Canada, Life and Times of Funqian, Huffington Post, Vancouver Province, Vancouver Sun, and the Saskatoon Star Phoenix. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.